adult radio writing. She is best known for her art book, We Go to the Gallery, and hopefully that's on sale in the bookshop. Um, and it's, I, I highly recommend it. It's, it's a bestseller. Uh, and, she, uh, and in that book, she illustrated the classic uh, Peter and Jane Ladybird books, which were so popular in the UK and internationally. And these characters um, are, are portrayed uh, grappling with conceptual art. Miriam graduated with a master's degree at the Royal College of Art in 2006 after completing a BA in graphic design at Brighton University. Um, it might be uh, a case, but uh, I've read that um, uh, her, faith, well, her faith in, Judea as a, in Judaism is also very important to her and an indirect influence on her work, not a direct influence. Um, and then f I will also introduce my colleague and co-curator, uh, Agnieszka Kolek. Now, Agnieszka Kolek is uh, the co-founder of Passion for Freedom. Uh, Agnieszka will actually give also an introduction um, herself. She has just started working here at the, 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 the castle, uh, Center at the, the Uyodovsky. Um, but in her own right, Agnieszka is an artist, curator, and as I mentioned, co founder of Passion for Freedom London Arts Festival. She holds an MA in Fine Arts from the University of the Arts London and lived in London for 20 years before moving back to Poland uh, only last month in December uh, 2021. In February 2015, uh, Agnieszka um, was um, involved in a debate uh, and um, as part of the Lars Vilks Committee, Lars Vilks is one of the artists in the political art exhibition as well as all uh, the artists on our panel. And uh, following that meeting, uh, there was a terror attack in Copenhagen. Um, but Agnieszka, uh, incredibly brave and important voice for freedom of expression, uh, said when there was that attack bullets were you know firing across uh, across this, uh, the hall um, and Yeska bravely said that they don't only want to kill us they also want to stop us talking so we should continue and the debate continued irrespective of the attack by terrorists um, so um, you know, great, and it's, it, without Agnieszka, I don't think any of us would be on this panel, so I really would like to thank you uh, for, um, uh, for bringing us uh, all here. Um, so without further ado, uh, I'm, I, I hope that uh, each artist is going to be talking for about 10 or 15 minutes, showing um, some wonderful visuals, and then we'll be having a conversation with them. This is a very informal debate, a uh, very informal discussion, uh, and we really want to invite and encourage uh, the audience member, you, to also ask questions, to put forward points of view, to disagree. And we are here to uh, be civil, but you know, not simply polite and agree with everything, but you know, to have a, 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 a meaningful conversation. So thank you. I'm going to pass you on now to Agnieszka. Thank you, Manik, for introducing our artists. Uh, thank you for coming and being with us. And thank you for joining us online on Facebook with Polish translation and on YouTube. We do hope you'll be coming back for more. Uh, I wanted to start uh, with Passion for Freedom. Ma Manik man mentioned that uh, I'm a co-founder and the main founder is Camila Forrest. Um, I've been the curator for the festival, but within this job I've done everything because we were always self-funded. When you talk about freedom, you cannot take money from governments, from politicians, from foundations, because there is always someone behind it. If you want to know what's going on with freedom and with someone wanting to take it away from you, follow the money. See where is it coming from. So we've been doing it all for 12 years in London. Um, when we started, people were unaware of the fact that they are slowly losing freedom. The idea of the festival was that uh, we open up a competition and we challenge artists to think about freedom. We think to think about what it is, how easy is it to lose it and how hard is it to get it back. With years, we also discovered that our enemies want us to, to give up on freedom thinking that there is nothing to defend, that our culture means nothing, that our culture doesn't deserve to continue. So we also ask artists, um, how do you preserve freedom and how do you celebrate it? Because we wanted to highlight the beauty of freedom, the beauty of our societies and what is there to be cherished. I wanted to mention the work of Mimsy that in 2015, just um, half a year after the attack at uh, Krutten in uh, 
in Copenhagen. We were not allowed to show these works. I would like to ask um, for the image, please. Um, so we were not allowed to show the uh, work of Mimsy. It's uh, titled Isis in Sylvania. We had a festival in September in the Mal Galleries uh, near Buckingham Palace in London. We, the gallery was contacted by Metropolitan Police and they were asked to um, remove the image because it's potentially inflammatory. We were advised that it's not a good idea to show it. And we were wondering why, because we couldn't understand um, how this work could um, upset anyone. Uh, can I please have the second image, please? So uh, it's a series of images, light boxes, and uh, they're showing our society enjoying the beauty of what we have, the freedom we have. And there is ISIS coming from different directions and attacking. Uh, the Metropolitan Police um, said that it's potentially inflammatory image and it shouldn't be shown. And if we dare to show it, they would advise that we pay for the police protection. £6,500 a day. We decided that we're going to find the money no matter what. But then it started the blackmailing in white gloves that maybe other works are not appropriate, they shouldn't be shown, the contract could be withdrawn. So we consulted with the artists and decided that we're going to create uh, postcards that would be given to to the public um, to inform them which works were deemed inappropriate for them to be seen. So, can I have the third image, please? Yes. Yes, so that was the one that was the most inflammatory, and we were wondering why. My idea was is that um, the lions of Islam are actually shown as mice and hamsters, so they got very upset, and they might come and uh, shoot at us. Um, so for me, why I wanted to open up with this image and this um, story, that this artwork is being shown now in Poland in political art exhibition. You can still see it today and tomorrow. So I advise everyone that is able to still come and see it, to come and see it, because knowing the situation in Western Europe, uh, we're not sure if this work will be shown soon anywhere else, except Poland probably, or maybe Hungary. So. <laughs> Um, I wanted to stress that over the years we've been giving platform to artists that they couldn't show their works and out of fear and sometimes they were actually blackmailed by the authorities not to show their works. So for me what is important is important to give the platform to let people talk and to solve the problems together because there is no other way. Um, so in this way, I would like to open our conversation and I would like to welcome uh, Firuzek to start with her presentation. Thank you.
Yes, um, the video was uh, not for, uh, I think it's nine years ago, I was invited uh, to a woman museum in uh, Aarhus, Jutland, in Denmark, to uh, perform a live video um, performance. And uh, you could see the. it was hard for me to to get out of the the burka it was so hard to to come out of the burka i couldn't see and um yes there are so many symbols in the in the video and um yes and i i make it because all my artworks uh, is to uh, remind me and you that freedom is not given three million a billion people live in a dictatorship and the number is getting higher for every day democracy can vanish overnight we have seen that in many uh, countries uh, if you cherish your freedom don't be silent being free is not is to be able to point out injustice. Not doing doing it so it can wait for freedom to fall. So speak out also if you are an artist. So um, yes, uh, this picture is it's calling light of my eye. Um, that's uh, actually a copy, uh, an Iranian protest um, in an uh, Islamic um, revolution. The, the bank notes were still from the, the Shah and uh, the people who was uh, protecting the Shah and loved the Shah, they uh, used the bank notes notes to uh, point out um, that they don't like the, the Alatoya. So it's actually a, a copy of a protest. So, yeah. And uh, this, is, this is me. Um, it's a serial uh, photographic of six pieces. You can see it. Uh, the last day is tomorrow. And um, it's uh, me being a woman that had acid on her face. Um, I could be that woman in Iran. Um, so... Yeah. And this is actually um <laughs> it called a faithful follower. It's a Islamic girl in Iran that uh, loved the the terrorist. And it actually this photograph was uh, censored in a Facebook, because they said that uh, I'm not li lying to uh, allow to to show a terrorist. But the point is that you don't. It's not good to do that. That was that was the point of the the picture. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. This is um, yeah. It's also me. Um, it's called uh, medieval property, and uh, this I could also be her if I was living in Iran, and I um, yes, it could also be me. I could be uh, Islamic, or I could be a girl who had uh, acid on her face, and so on and so on. So.
I'm, I'm done. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for his uh, passing it now. Um, thank you very much for coming. Uh, my name is Taslim Malhal. Um, I'm a British Yemeni artist. Um, this is where I was born and brought up. But before I start, I would like to thank Anishka and uh, Madis to giving me this opportunity in this amazing, uh, I can't pronounce the Ukask. Yukaski Castle, uh, uh, pardon my pronunciation, me no English. <laughs> so, anything I can't pronounce. Um, but I, uh, it's, it's, it's really quite an honor to be amongst um, amazing artists. Uh, and uh, the exhibition is still running, so you have the opportunity um, to see the exhibition. Uh, the, the image, some of the image that will be used, actually they are uh, uh, exhibiting in a, uh, in a museum. Uh, so the, 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 tomorrow is the last day. So please, if you can, go and visit. There's amazing 28 artists. Some of the work maybe you will not uh, agree or approve, but uh, freedom is very important. And for artists like, um, like me and like Feruza and Miriam, is uh, a, a institution to give this platform for artists to to exhibit their work and to show their work with a lot of organization will dismiss it so um thank you um th for the organization to, to giving me and many artists opportunity uh, now i born and brought up in aid in yemen basically um creator and this is was my childhood basically where i uh, fish and um the beach was like my, you know, you got a park, we got a beach. Um, uh, so that's just the map where, uh, so I went South Yemen. South Yemen, it, it was part of British Empire and then became um, uh, uh, communist and then dictatorship and then Sharia law. So um, I experienced all. <laughs> Uh, uh, this is uh, with my family in Yemen, how life was brilliant when you're young, you have no worry about anything. Um, so my mother's Indian um, and my father is Yemeni uh, and that's my sibling. I think my mom was pregnant with my youngest sister. I'm very, very proud uh, of my heritage, my background. Uh, like I said, I'm a Yemeni and Indian. Um, there is my, my work, uh, which is maybe the next... Um, yeah, that uh, actually, I came into, um, like I said, I left, yeah, I came to UK in 85, left for civil war. So this is actually, a, I, I think I was, um, I came at 14, and that's, I think here, I was 15. So again, um, uh, with my parents. Uh, and then I, I actually, there, there's, I run away after my 17th birthday uh, from forced marriage. And it took me a long time to talk about it and start like, to have the courage. So I started uh, campaigning and I was ambassador for Freedom Charity. And actually I'm very proud and lucky to be part of changing the law, making forced marriage illegal. And also now in UK, the law has changed to raise the to marriage to 18, which I'm very proud of uh, being part of that. Um, so that's Anita, the founder uh, of uh, Freedom Charity. Um, and like I said, I, I spend, I dedicate my, my, my life actually um, is to, to speak out how destructive can be forced marriage and to, to not to have that opportunity. I mean, the point that uh, I, uh, I left Yemen because of the civil war to come in UK to have a beginning and opportunity to flourish, how do you say it in English? Reef. Leaf, leaf flourish, uh, and um, to be that not uh, actually, it's, it's kind of the the culture. I, like I said, is I'm very proud of my culture and heritage, but there's certain things need to be changed and need to have an open dialogue about it. Need to honesty about it. Look, um, uh, something that it's not working and it's not going to progress. We need to scrap it. Um, uh, so yeah, so that's. A dedicated child marriage, forced marriage, um, uh, women rights. Uh, I, I, I was like, it, it was kind of a little bit painful because I have to repeat my incident, and and nobody, no seventeen-year-old girl want to be, you know, run away from home and to be homeless and to, to the danger on that vulnerability. So, but I thought I was lucky enough because I had amazing people actually came and helped me and support me. Um, and um, it, it was, so I thought, I wanna, I wanna change 
and make a difference and tell to the, any young girl going through or of knowing somebody who's actually going through it, uh, reach out. There is organization, there is help. Um, and uh, no matter what you're going to do, uh, what happened, you can survive it. You can, you know, um, I don't like that victimhood, you know, I'm... Uh, I'm a strong lady, um, so that's that. I, I kind of said, you know, get up and, you know, sort of whatever life will face you, you have to just kind of keep um, fighting, you know. Um, yeah, so I, I uh, spending a lot of my time speaking out and conferences and uh, highlighting, because when I started, there was no, no one actually was talking about forced marriage, child marriage, FGM, so uh, I dedicated a lot. And beginning, I can understand, my parents were not very pleased and um, I didn't see them for many years, um, but now I have amazing relationship with them. Um, it took a long time, but uh, I understood and I respect uh, this uh, again is that the way my grandmother married age 11, my auntie 13, my mother 15. So it isn't buried in the culture, uh, but it is a change. There is, um, th there is you can you can change things and um, and make it in a way that the next generation doesn't suffer. They don't have to go through this. Uh, again, I took. Um, uh, Dolls for Child Bride, that project, I took it to Hasso um, Common and also a great dear friend of mine, uh, Jonathan Rees Myers, a great actor, he came on board and spot and we were highlighting this issue because there was a huge problem in Yemen of Child Bride and then trying to change uh, the law in there, um, unfortunately, it didn't happen, uh, but at least I'm proud that we done it, we succeed in England, in UK. Um, now, um, Stone, because of me running away from forced marriage and I did what not usually Yemeni, well, I, there's no one who done what I did and lived to tell the tales. Um, so my, my work and my experience is, is how the Sharia law, um, which is can affect and only apply unto women. And so for me, it was if... And also, a lot of people who saw this project, um, they kind of always nude on it. I think if that's all you can actually see, then it's nothing about nudity. It's, it's, it, they kill you because you dare to stand up for your right. I mean, it still happened. It happened in Afghanistan. I don't know if somewhere in Iran, I don't know if it still happened in Iran. Um, but in Afghanistan is still happening and some part in Yemen will happen because you've got a tribal and it's a very conservative, very um, Sharia law that's uh, the, the law of the land. Um, and I have to say, um, um, if, if you're going to maybe the next, um, Jamila. Jamila is, again, it's a su first self-portrait. Um, and um, I am self-taught artist. When I um, approach a lot of um, uh, art college and art industry, they ask me, where's, where's your qualification? I didn't have any because, you know, when I ran away from, I was not, I was not encouraged to study back in Yemen. I was pulled out of school. And then when I came in, in UK, I didn't, I didn't went to school. I went to special school to learn English. Um, and then I ran away and I got married. I have amazing four wonderful kids. Well, they are my inspiration and they are actually my, uh, my um, they're the one who kept me going. Um, so I'm very proud of them. Uh, and so the, Jamila is actually, um, as an artist, when you have uh, a support, um, again, my dear friend Jonathan Reed Myers actually got, bought this pa painting and I said to him one day when I get when I um can I buy it one day back from you he said no it's mine so that's uh, Jimmy it's, it's the vulnerability um uh, of of her fear of being watched all the time and the whole point that you wear the you cover up head to toes is, is to cover your identity your beauty is in a way is a sexuality women as sexual being um is not for, it's not recognized, it's not, it's forbidden in my culture, and it's taboo, however it is. Uh, so that's called Jamila. Um, I remember when I ran away from forced marriage, and my father, I um, mean, I was even hiding for mana killing, uh, my father said, you disowned my name. 
And I said, Dad, one day I will honor your name. And I actually made this bet. So that's my father's name. And he came to my first exhibition. Um, I'm based in Red Lead Studio. Um, it, it's a great studio. And I, I had my first exhibition in there. My father came and he actually cried. We both cry and hug each other. He's actually very supportive now, now of my work and what I do. Um, a lot of my work, I know the little bit pushing the boundary, but then standing, I can, not long, a few weeks go and I went to see him, uh, uh, you know, um, gosh, oh, she's an artist, you know. And I said, Dad, when I come to your house, I will be your daughter. So I have the rules that, you know, uh, there's an understanding and respect and they're my parents and I love them dearly. Um, and, and, and that it is, but he, he's now very supportive and actually that's to honor his name. Um, stolen education, as I said, uh, back in Yemen, I was pulled out of school, and girls were not encouraged to um, go to school. And, and what I did, I could be beheaded, shot. <laughs> um, so it said, words may kill you, but I'm not afraid to die. Um, because I, my campaign and my um, speaking, I got child and forced marriage, and speaking at certain situation in Sharia law, I mean, I did... Um, Maybe if we can go to the next one, because the next, yeah, this one, uh, silence. This, I have to say, um, truly, I will not be here um, and having uh, had the courage or having to carry on to actually express and, um, and to, show, to, to, to be the artist that I want to show my work what. Because art, in a way, is it gives you, it saved me. It gave me that voice. It gave me the confidence. It gave me the... the the opportunity to expand and say, no matter where you come from and what you go through, you know, there, there is a certain uh, soul, to, you know, um, silence um, with that passion of freedom. Anishka, which I met in 2013, I was so terrified and a lot of the gallery and organization saw this image and they loved it, but said, we can't show it. But passion for freedom gave me that opportunity. And, and I, when I was showing that to Anishka, she said, um, I was so nervous, <laughs> do you remember? And, and she had to get, ah, no, you, you know, you're gonna be fine. And, and, and Passion for Freedom gave me that confidence to say, I can push that more boundary, have, show my work, because I know they will take it on. Because sadly, a lot of organizations don't do that. And I urge people, if you can, support Passion for Freedom because they are very crucial. They're not just to do the talk, they will do the walk too. So I am always going to be grateful for Passion for Freedom. Actually, the dagger is my father's dagger. And the burkas, all my sister-in-law, I remember when I asked him, um, can I borrow your, you know, your and then they goes, oh, maybe she, my father said, maybe she's changed, you know, it's great. And uh, they, had no <laughs> they had no idea. And again, it's not about nudity. It's about, you know, you covering what's underneath all this is me as, that, as a woman, as, as, the, as that human being, you know. Um, so, th you know, I, I, I got in big trouble. Actually, I got a death threat. Um, um, I received death threat and... I had uh, a lot of uh, problem with it, and even my parents well, didn't talk to them or see them for for a long time. But um, yeah, this is passion for freedom. That's I am here because of them. Be honest, they they they, they gave me the courage and a, a opportunity to actually go and 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 to say whatever you work, you're gonna cut. We will. You have a platform to come and show it. So next, please. Ah, um, this is uh, Zach Goldsmith, my, um, M he was my MP, and I am um, the, um, uh, the Deputy Ambassador. Um, I have to say, the M Yemeni Embassy and the, all the ambassador were very, very supportive, and um, even sometimes financially too. I exhibit in New York and Los Angeles, um, um, international Israel. Um, I received the flag because I, in 2018, I was actually trained to go to South Pole. Now, this is the first ever 
uh, flag been given to Yemeni and especially to women. So I'm proud of that. So I'm hoping one day um, I'm actually trying to raise the fund uh, uh, to go to South Poly Kozola. So if anybody out there want to, uh, you know, so, uh, sponsor me would be great. And, you know, and it, it's, it's like, for me, it's like, to, why not uh, uh, Yemeni? Why, you know, I can be explorer, you know, I, I want to encourage the next generation and, I'm, and I always hope and dream and I know things will change in Yemen um, and will be the next. I, it's like my kids always laugh to me, oh, you're the first Yemeni. I said, and maybe I'm the first, but I hope I'm not the last. So thank you. Miriam, you're next. This is me. No, wait. Oh. <laughs> you changed. You're the first Yemeni in the South Pole. Is it working? Is it working? Yes. So how do I change the images, or does it just? Uh, it's going to happen now. The gentleman is getting oh. it. Oh, <laughs> what's all this stuff on the outside? Um, so, oh, sorry. A bit about myself. My name's Miriam Elia. I'm a British artist, satirist, weirdo. <laughs> um, I trained at the Royal College of Art I grew up in London uh, in a kind of uh, middle class lib liberal artistic family a little bit off the wall so both my parents met at art school uh, my dad is a Syrian Jew who, well he's, he's part, half Lebanese, half Syrian and he came to Britain in the 70s because he got into the Royal College of Art which is where he met my mum who whose parents came from Poland, Lithuania in um, about 1900 to, to Britain. Uh, so she's of Polish, Lithuanian, Jewish descent and my dad's Syrian Jewish. Um, so that's a little bit about my family. And yeah, so I, I grew up with all my roots being from other countries, but somehow fitting into this very British way of life. <laughs> um, I can't say I've ever suffered any horrendous discrimination or forced child marriage or anything like that. I was, I was quite happy, uh, had quite a happy childhood. Uh, but I was always constantly made aware of the um, complete insanity that my, 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 my parents went through. So I, I was always like, oh, that sounds terrible. <laughs> Thank God I live in Muswell Hill. Um, so this was, because this, this whole thing was about art and migration, this was a really recent commission I had from Walthamstow Art Council. Um, and it was about aliens coming to to Walthamstow, which is a North London, quite sort of boring suburb. I'm actually the one on the left. That's me in the costume. Um, and it was about them sort of... Buy, so aliens come to kind of suburban England, buy it up and gentrify it. Um, so this was their first purchase, which is a, a two-bed semi in Chingford. Um, it, it's, it's very much about immigrants coming to... London, because I grew up in London, and, and, and having that dream of just owning a, a semi-detached house and having a normal life, you know, which is essentially kind of how I grew up, not having to deal with war and conflict and forced marriage and religion and all those things. They can just have a nice, normal, cushy life in Chingford. So um, if you, that, the one on the right is my brother, and I'm the one on the left. And that, I couldn't wear that for long because it kept falling off. It was a, it was a <laughs> bucket, like a... <laughs> A, a little miniature bathtub on my head. But if you do the next one. Oh. Oh. My, my presentation doesn't look as good as everyone else. <laughs> no, no, that's, that's you. Okay. We're, going, we're going backwards now. Computer said no. Computer. It's okay. It's yeah. Okay. Um... Oh, wait, there, there's some things. Oh, this is a very old collage about migration. Um, I remember asking my grandma what she did when she first arrived in Britain. This was uh, many years ago. She said, I had to get my hair done. <laughs> I dumped my suitcase and I went and got my hair done. And I always remember her saying that. And so I did this collage as a kind of response. It's called permed luggage. <laughs> it's really surreal, but that's the way my head works. Um, this is a new one actually I did in my sketchbook yesterday about where things are going with the corona insanity um, and you can see that's kind of a 
Nazi officer going, papers, please. <laughs> it's like very fascist wartime. And then there's a guy there with a huge, huge <laughs> ne needle waiting to inject the next person uh, for their papers. So it's just, again, it's more surreal um, stuff. All right, next. Is it, this is not in any order, is it? Oh. Uh, yeah, if you go one before that, we go to the gallery. So this is the book that I'm best known for in England. Um, okay, so um, you can buy this at the shop. So, oh no, if you go back. Oh, it's going all over the place, isn't it? Um, so yeah, my, my parents um, spent my child... I mean, every, every weekend we'd have to go to an art gallery. So I was very much... <laughs> brought up in, in art galleries. We didn't get to go to Chessington or, you know, theme parks or McDonald's or anything that normal children did. It was always like highbrow theatre or Whitechapel Art Gallery. And I would just spend my time just wandering around installations as an eight-year-old, like trying to play on a Game Boy or just pass the time whilst my parents just like stared intensely at work. <laughs> for, for hours <laughs> like, can we go now <laughs> um, so We Go to Gallery was basically a reflection of my entire childhood spent in galleries um, and I had these kind of like progressive parents who were really out there I mean, my uncle was like uh, one of the key figures in the punk movement in the UK uh, he was also like a gay icon. Uh, so I definitely wasn't from a normal family. And it was very clear to any kid that came to my house that it was just a bit off the wall. Um, so uh, the Ladybird books that my mum had, which were from the 60s, um, they were always in the first floor in the children. She, had, she collected old children's books. And I thought they were amazing. I used to spend... Every, all, this, all this time just looking at the illustrations of this happy, normal family and thinking, this is so not my family. I wish this was my family. My family are so weird. Uh, you know, we have giant sculptures of transsexual icons in the front room. My dad even did an abstract man with a ginormous erection and he put it in the front window. <laughs> like, it was a square man with an erection. That was just normal in my family. And he collects meat grinders. My mum had corsets over it. Really weird. But well, obviously, what, what is normal to you? It's just, it's just your choice. It's just yeah. the way it is, right? Um, so when I looked at this Ladybird book family, I was like, oh, that's, you know, that's normal, nice people that live in Sylvanian families and whatever. Um, so at some point, the two worlds came crashing together in my head. I thought, wouldn't it be amazing if this lovely 60s happy family with rigid gender roles and, you know, was to come into my life and comment on it. And that's how We Go to the Gallery was formed. So it's just them walking around an art, art gallery and there's just like nothing in the room because it's completely nihilistic or there's a giant vagina painting or... <laughs> it's, it's all the kind of modern art um, symbols. And, but the work in itself was supposed to be a piece of art. It's, it's, it wasn't a... I wasn't being derogatory. It was, it was a, it an artwork in itself, and it's a, about my life. But this is the first time I've ever actually talked about it in that way. Um, so, yeah, so that's, that's that. It became a, a private eye magazine in the UK. I really loved it because it's very funny, and I, I write funny things. They're, they're dark and meaningful, but they're also funny. So I ended up doing regular periodicals for Private Eye. I do a regular piece for The Critic, just still using this family that I adore. I've done six books... I've done the whole of lockdown with this family. Uh, and it very much, mummy is like the progressive liberal middle class. And you just see them going more and more bonkers. And what they think just makes less and less sense. And I think the reason I'm so good at it is because I grew up in the art establishment. I, I, you know, yeah. all the people that are running The Guardian, you know, running the arts um, agenda, you know, I know them personally. So I kind of know how they think in their own conflict. And that's why it makes them laugh. But the next one, yeah, this was about her going on holiday uh, <laughs> with the kids. It says, we are going on holiday. Mummy has booked us on a special package tour. 
Why are we going to a poor country, asked John, so that we can learn about their suffering and because it's cheap, says Mummy. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so we can go to the next one. So this was another book I did. I just illustrate, write books, do films, radio, all sorts. Piggy Goes to Uni was about the kind of radical socialist agenda that most of my secular friends had grown up in. Um, there's one weird paradox about my life, is that although I came from this family that were completely out there and did giant modernist abstract erection sculptures, they were also really into Judaism, which, so I was taken to synagogue every Friday, I had to go to Haida three times a week, I was taught to love Hashem and, uh, you know, do all of this very, very conservative religious um, values about morals and ethics. Um, uh, and at the same time, after synagogue, we'd go and see some guy getting naked at the Whitechapel Gallery and... <laughs> some weird performance piece or you know my, my, my uncle would be dressed as a ginormous condom or something and I'd go and meet him at a party for transsexuals and then, uh, then you'd go back to the rabbi's office and you were like back at JFA so I had these, I feel like I grew up in several worlds and also my dad being an Arab was also you know quite out there too, he was like the black sheep of his family um, that's a whole other story but I noticed anyway in the secular world that I inhabited like that socialism had always been the kind of thing that people were you know on about but it didn't you know then you had Id identitarianism which you're, you guys are going to talk about later so Piggy Goes to Uni was a kind of a take on Animal Farm by George Orwell um, but the idea was that the pigs just felt this terrible guilt about their empire um, <laughs> and, and they were responsible for all the other suffering of the animals in the world. So if you go, so Piggy is like a young, optimistic pig that goes to university. And if you go to the next one, yeah, he he finds out about his pig privilege. Um, see, there's a little triangle of oppression which says uh, pink male pigs are at the top, and then everyone else is in the middle, and then mud is at the bottom. <laughs> But it's essentially two different worldviews. One, with this worldview, it's like all about collectives and groups. And in my, my Jewish Orthodox worldview, it was all about individuals and morals and God. Do you understand? So it was two. One is about the collective and one is about the individual. So I only really, it took me 20, 30 years to kind of figure that out. So there were two different systems going on. I mean, I'll bet they come up in a new way in every generation. But So this pig is funny about how he's oppressed and tortured. All, all, all his ancestors have profited from you know, other species. If you go on to the next one. And this is his nightmare about pig imperialism. <laughs> so there he is looking at... Oh, look, there's a pig putting his feet up on a sheep, you know. So it's, it's, it's a view of history where you only see things in terms of power. So power struggles and victims. Um, and I actually think that that's slightly disingenuous. I think, I think life is a lot more complicated than that. Um, and then it, it, it kind of gets you by your guilt, this guilt, and it stops you from talking and reduces you to being a pig or being a duck or being whatever animal you are. It just reduces you to one thing in, in the collective rather than you as an individual autonomous beautiful person so anyway I'm going off a bit but so Piggy Goes to Uni is all about collectivism and identitarianism um, and it's all written through through the eyes of, of, of this you know, university pig um, this was a very rare edition I only did very very few copies of this so if you can get it he's got one but yeah I didn't make many uh, this is called Invasion of Zone 6, <laughs> which is about, um, it's, it's just about the fear and anxiety of suburbia taking on the world. And during the lockdown, this kind of really brought on a new uh, meaning to me. Um, it's like my house versus the universe, you know. Um, it's, it, it wasn't, obviously, it was made like 10, 15 years ago, but it... It's very, like, for me, it's a very powerful image. Um, I was also kind of brought up to think that the, the suburban dream was, like, this terrible thing, that you had to be a bohemian and live, you know, 
amongst the other cultures. <laughs> I'm going to talk about that a bit as well. But so th that was a reflection on it. I'm going to do the next one. Oh, we've done that one. I think that's it. Um, there's obviously tons more work th that I've got. But um, I think yeah, the, the one thing I wanted to talk about was the theme of art and migration, about the sentiment that we attach to outsiders um, and the way that's kind of informed my work, that I'm kind of laughing at that. Because I, although I'm not, uh, an immigrant to the UK, all of my family are, and they bring their kind of collective trauma with them. But it sometimes blinds you, that romance of the outsider, that, the, you know, when people talk to my dad, they go, oh, really, you're from Syria? Oh, that's amazing. He's like, no, it's a shithole. Um, <laughs> you know, the way you talk to people as if they're coming from another country. I don't know about Poland, because this is not, this, you know, we can't have this discussion in England. But... It, it, it's this kind of romanticization of being from another culture uh, that is kind of blinds you to the individual flaws of people. And uh, that what Piggy Goes to Uni was about was about collectivism. It's like sort of lumping everybody together in a category with, without any, and, and that being your moral compass. And that doesn't really work for me. Um, it, it seemed, and also, the narrative that my dad had of coming to England with no money, no English, like 50 quid or something, like just nothing. And by in 20 years, he had two design businesses. He had a big house that he bought. He had this weird shop that he put together with other artists. Like he was, he was doing amazing things. And he used to say, Miriam, you just couldn't do this in my country. You just couldn't do... This is just the, the, the blessing of, of being in the UK. So, at one hand, I had that, that narrative of outsiders coming to England and having a fantastic life. I'll bet they had some discrimination here and there, but it wasn't like the thing that characterised their existence. And then you had the indigenous middle-class population telling you that you were, you know, oh, the suffering, the suffering of immigrants. Oh, we've been terrible. So it was two different stories being told. So what I would love to do is open up a discussion about that because, anyway, I'll, I'll stop there. But thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam. And uh, please, a round of applause to all of our four wonderful um, uh, artists, speakers. Uh, I think what, what we're getting in the, the, the narratives that are being expressed here is, is really just the kind of diversity of uh, these stories of um, uh, being an immigrant or a migrant or, or children of uh, uh, migrants. My, you know, my story is quite similar to Miriam's, to be honest. You know, my, my mother and father, hard-working class family who worked for the state in railways and the, the health service, um, their dream was to buy a, a Zone 3 house. A Zone 3 house, which is a bit more upmarket than Zone 6, in my opinion, <laughs> uh, in, in, in Ballam, which has changed hugely. Ballam is so gentrified. It's a, a, yeah. a town in South London. Uh, there used to be a joke that um, this comedian called Peter Sellers used to go, Balham, Balham, gateway to the south, Balham, welcome to Balham, as a, as a kind of tourist attraction. But it was pretty boring, to be honest. But it was a very mixed immigrant community there, too. Um, uh, which has changed, the demographics has changed hugely uh, 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 over the decades. Uh, it's very rich now <laughs> and very boring, to be honest. <laughs> yes. um, so that's my brief story here. But I think um, what I want to um, do is all these, these incredible stories of, um, you know, you, both of you escaping from, you know, 1979 Iranian revolution for you, Farooza, and, you know, in, in Yemen, uh, this change of, political um, autocracies, you know, from um, uh, British colonialism to, um, to obviously, uh, communism, and then, you know, finally a sort of uh, a theocratic kind of uh, um, position. And, um, um, and just kind of bring it to the present day, because, you know, I think these, these are very powerful stories, and mine and Miriam's are a bit boring, to be honest. We just came and worked hard, and, you know, and, We're well... Lucky. My family was not as crazy as yours. They're they were just like, crazy, but, I mean, where else could they <laughs> worked hard. Yeah, 
Um, but and I, I just want to pose something because I think you know, with what's going on in the current migrant crisis, there's a humanitarian crisis. Uh, you know, we, we we hear the stories of what's going on in the Poland, but the Polish-Belarus border. Um, we know what's going on in the English Channel and the Channel crossings. Um, but I, thinking of how artists are, interpret the world and interpret the story of migration. Uh, I just want to quote an Iranian author who I admire hugely. Uh, she's, uh, her name's Azar Nafisi. She wrote two fantastic books that I read. One is uh, Reading Lolita in Tehran, and the other one is called Republic of Imagination. And um, in Republic of Imagination, she posits this uh, idea of what a republic of the imagination should be. And she describes it as a land with no borders and few restrictions, a world that runs parallel to the real one, whose occupants need no passport or documentation. The only requirement for entry are an open mind, a restless desire to know, and an indefinable, indefinable urge to escape the mundane. That's, I think, a wonderful um, uh, uh, dream. Obviously, in the real world, um, what are the entry requirements? Um, and certainly, we would like to see people with an open mind um, uh, come to host countries. We would like to see a desire for knowledge, a desire to know. And as we see in, in your work, this kind of reinvention, you know, re re the struggle in your work uh, of shedding the burqa and the hijab and the niqab and the headscarf, um, it almost feels like you are a butterfly um, and uh, struggling for this rebirth and this reinvention. And that seems to be a very common story for, for people that escape tyranny, you know, is to, to redefine and reinvent themselves. Um, so I think, um, you know, I, I just wanted to kind of See, th get some thoughts on what that idea is. You know, the ideal of the this sense of freedom, which I think everyone aspires to, but also the um, uh, what are the entry requirements? You know, uh, because obviously with um, um, migrants, and certainly unless they're coming through official means um, uh, of applying for visas or applying for refugee status, uh, that you, you don't know. There's a kind of abstract homogeneity going on. Um, so just wanted to kind of get your thoughts uh, on that, if anyone would like to kick off. I, is it working? Okay. I, I do think it's, um, like I said, in a bit born and brought up in Yemen when I first came in UK, um, it was um, it's a very kind of, uh, first of all, it was cold. You know, being in South Yemen, there is no such a thing as a, weather, <laughs> everything, it was hot. Um, it was a lot of, and, and lots of not speaking English, it's a very difficult, um, I think also finding you, um, which I understand why a lot of people uh, who migrate to uh, UK or whatever country, they bring their certain culture with them because their identity of losing who they are. And, and I said to my parents, you know, yeah, I'm Yemeni and Indian. That's never going to go away. That's who I am. That's the beauty about it. And then taking um, the best thing out of my culture and, 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 and celebrate it. And the negative highlight it and say, time needs changing. So I think uh, with the migration or people who migrate to different countries, it, it is hard work, it's a struggle, um, but it's not impossible. I mean, you have to think about it. Why me always remember the reason you left your home is because there was no opportunity. You couldn't do things what you have now in UK or in the Western world. So I find it, it, it can be challenged, but, and the idea of my um, being migrate um, or you are kind of victim. I remember when I was campaigning, this woman said to me, but you don't look like the woman gone through it. I said, what do you want me to do, cry? Be you know, uh, be the victim. I can't. How, how we will encourage other girl or another person to actually say, you know, I never had the role model, so I have to become one. And I hope uh, I, I, if I can inspire one girl and I can encourage other girl, there is no, there's nothing you can, can achieve. I always say to people, dream is free, so dream big. 
and there's nothing you cannot do, no matter what your background or your skin color or, or what. And I laughed at because when you was talking about your parents dragging you in the gallery, I'm for, <laughs> I'm the one. I have the, my 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 younger two kids. It's amazing because um, I remember uh, to, to being an an artist, female artist, and being a mother, a single mother. It was tough. To juggle, but they come home and what you know. I got Charlie. There's wax in the floor. I got crucifix here. I got like a butterfly there. So you remind me, and I'm thinking, oh my God, maybe my kids. That's what they think, you know. <laughs> and taking them to galleries, and you know. Uh, but yeah, I, th I think uh, the, the idea that people be migrated or migration or uh, they're a little weak. They need help, you know. Yeah, I, 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 yeah that I don't like it. I'm not bled. Uh, yeah, I, I, no. Um, be fabulous. I always say there's nothing you, you know. You, you have opportunity to do whatever you want. It's only your thinking will stop you. You know, it's how you think. You know, I'm proud to be Yemen in Indian. I can, I speak three languages. You know. Um, so I, I, I do think that the attitude every mig migrant person is poor uh, and, you know. It, it's about it, this, um, it, it is quite, um, the problem is not the migrant, it's the kind of attitude to this fake caring. It's like, um, yeah. I, I often feel that it, everything's so superficial now that it's like, Oh, you know, like a, a packet of cornflakes, and there's 20 migrants to collect. Like, yeah, I've got what you know what I mean. It's like you're reduced to just being a, vi a victim that needs yeah. help, and it's more about the narcissism of the people on the other side going, "Oh, you poor people, how can we help you?" How? And it's, it's like, you know, people don't need people need to feel empowered and just yeah. self-respect. It's very infantilizing, yeah. um, you know. And my dad has never. You know, the way also, the, the dominant woke narrative in the West is this constant, like, fetishization of the suffering of immigrants. It's almost like a Jesus figure, you know? Like a replacement religion. Like, the curation of the exhibitions is always like, you know, the, st the story of Jamaicans coming to England is like, they always have to show you a picture of a, ho of a hotel in the 60s that says, no blacks, no Irish, no dogs, to constantly remind you how terrible, how racist, how xenophobic, how awful the British people are, and how they don't really exist anyway. And it's actually more of an exercise in debasement, self-debasement, than it is about connecting to other cultures. Yeah, because it's quite interesting. Because it's really, they're not yeah. remotely interested in the other culture. It's more about reflection, a, a negative, constant negative self-reflection. And until the yeah. West learns, Western and Western Europeans learn that they exist, okay, yeah, their past is as flawed as any other country's past. As any other country, we're all flawed. But, but this constant yeah. debasement is a kind of form of narcissism. It's almost like saying, your suffering is my... Is, uh, the only reason you're suffering is because of me and my uh, ancestors. Uh, how? Yeah, exactly. No, it isn't. Yeah, but <laughs> no, it uh, isn't. But also okay, you know, like, how dare they? Yeah. How dare they do that? If that's the dominant middle-class, white, liberal, right. progressive right. narrative, and that is the thing that needs to be questioned, because it's not... <laughs> Under the guise of anti-racism. No, but it, do you know what, Mariam? Also, like uh, you know, Western is racism and on how. I'm thinking then there would be not that many hundreds and millions of people migrated to a Western country because you want freedom. Freedom. I'd rather mm. die of hunger than have one breath without freedom. I lived under dictatorship, communism, and Sharia law. It's not, it's not fun, I'm telling you. So, t t we she's, are she's privileged. Actually, yeah, you I actually. lived it. I'm t it's, it it's, that's why I'm, I, I'm lucky enough um, uh, to, to, to come to UK. If, if the Western world is lose the freedom, wh where the heck are we going to go? Yeah. There's nowhere to go. Poland. Yeah. <laughs> well, I actually, I'm, think, I'm thinking to actually move to Poland. I just, My great spirit. Yeah. Yep. I, I, I actually that. So I, I, I love the, the, the Polish. Uh, you guys, you know, don't take any nonsense. So I like that. You know, you, you, I mean, that the fact if we have this political art exhibition, no way in mm -hmm. any way we can ha you can have uh, 28 artists pushing that boundary. 
It, it's amazing. So I'm may thinking p moving to Poland. Any any <laughs> any job offer? <laughs> Theresa, yeah. Have you got some um, thoughts? Yeah. Uh, when my mom and dad uh, went out of uh, Iran, we actually uh, had this idea that uh, we will stay in Turkey because uh, my mom and dad was saying, ah, the the war is over and we will be in Turkey and we can come back to Iran. But uh, we couldn't stay in Turkey. Um, in the 80s, there was no organizations or help uh, other places. You have to do uh, the whole, uh, yeah, the whole pack package of yourself. And um, we didn't give uh, the opportunity to, to choose uh, a country so we, we could take a plane actually to Poland and we couldn't stay in Poland but we could take a, a, a plane to Germany and uh, the Germans uh, give us two choices um, one of the choices was uh, the US and, and uh, Denmark my father wants to go to the US, but my mom says, ah, 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 Denmark, because it's not far away. So it actually, um, we couldn't choose. So, so it, it was Denmark, because it was uh, yeah, um, the, the shortest uh, way. We couldn't actually uh, be in, uh, in uh, Germany. So. The, yeah, and um, I think that um, it's not the, there's so many types of immigrants and the climate immigrants and the, the political immigrants, uh, economic. economic immigrants. And um, I was actually in uh, Greece uh, for several times, different places. And uh, because my ex husband was uh, working for the Frontex, is a uh, uh, the, the police and um, the military uh, to take places of the, the borders. And uh, actually I saw with my own eyes what is happening. And it actually, the, the whole problem is that the, 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 the uh, what do you call it, the, the people who take money of the immigrants, they are the biggest problem because they are uh, saying lo lots of things that are not um, yeah, possible and they are lying for them um, to make money. Yeah. So the, the problem is the smugglers. The yeah. trafficking. Yeah. Oh my God, yeah. yeah. But, the, but the, it, this is interesting because there's so many conversations to be had, but everything is papered over with this romanticism. Yeah. It's like you can't you can't have any discussion anymore because you're in England it's gone crazy like you're a racist you're a racist you're a racist actually they, even if you're from an immigrant background yourself you know if someone's watching this on YouTube they're a bit Miriam's a Nazi yeah. <laughs> I'm like they, I'm Jewish doesn't matter you're still a Nazi yeah it's that is the level of of brainwashing and it needs to be um, it needs to be questioned because it's it's a, a lie. It's a complete lie, and it's going to lead to so much destruction. You know, it, sometimes the story of the golden calf in the, in the Bible is really important to me because it's about how it's not about the golden calf. It's about having a subject that is beyond discussion. It becomes like a godlike thing, whether it's you know the immigrant status or wh whatever it is that you want to put up there. That is like if you if you question this, you're a terrible person, and that is that is the problem that that, that it's become these series of unquestionable uh, romantic things, and the people that that spout, espouse this, I think the, the complete opposite is true, you know, and the, so that's what I think anyway. So on that note, I I also wanted to bring some of my thoughts on the subject. So as as you know from Manik's introduction, I just moved back to Poland after 20 years in Great Britain in London. Uh, I went there to also fulfill my dreams, become an artist and exhibit and work. And I just returned, and I returned because I couldn't take on uh, any more terror attacks, knife attacks. And, um, and the unwillingness of the politicians to discuss the issue. And I think for all of us, no matter 
what point of view we have, we have to remember that we shouldn't stay, we shouldn't allow to be divided into two camps mm -hmm. that become black and white. What we have to do, we have to question the politicians, all of them, because mm -hmm. they like to divide us and put us in camps and create this kind of um, artificial division. But then when the question comes, they run for the hills. And the, the, the big wake up, I've been struggling with PTSD after terror attack for, for a few years now. Um, it's easier, it's harder. Um, and the, the autumn in England for me was terrible, uh, especially after the uh, killing of the, of the MP, uh, killed in his constituency, meeting his constituents in a Methodist church. That was on Friday afternoon. And on Monday morning, the headlines were about the climate change and how the politicians want to solve the weather. And I was thinking, there is no hope for me because my health is failing. And the politicians, they, they think they can change the weather and control it, but they are unwilling to discuss the problems of terrorism, of uh, violations of women's rights, um, radicalization of young people that feel lost because they cannot kind of find themselves with this huge clash of different cultures and civilization um, and they seek the way and the community with radicals. Uh, they, the politicians don't want to discuss the foreign money coming into the country influencing elections, whether it would be in De Germany from the Turkish government, whether it would be Muslim Brotherhood influencing the Muslim vote in various countries around the world. They don't want to talk about it. They want to talk about the weather. So, so this is one thing we have to remember. We need to question uh, politicians, no matter what color they wear, no matter what they say, whether they say they're conservative, whether they say they, they, they care about the world and the pain in the world. <laughs> um, fine, but what's your solution? And I want to see the results. Um, it's all fine to open the borders, but then who's going to help these people to learn the language? Here, I also wanted to make a point that the politicians with the good intentions, they come up with the idea, let's translate everything. I, I worked in the UK, there were translations, there were up to seven, ten translations, you go to the doctor or you have a meeting at school with a child, um, and then people are not empowered and enabled to become participants of our democracy. So we say we cherish democracy. We want to share it with the world, but we don't encourage people to become participants in this, in this uh, round table, in this discussion. So for me, what my, Miriam was saying is very hypocritical of people, what they say, and narcissistic. I completely agree, because if you don't empower people to learn the language, to become full citizens, understanding the process and taking active part, you're making them victims second time and you're setting them up for failure and at the, at the conflict with the population in the country. Because being a citizen is on not only rights, but also responsibilities. I met a Polish lady that she worked for 10 years in, in Britain. She was working in a school kitchen and she never had the chance to properly learn English because the way the system was set, she was not earning enough to make a living, so she had to get additional benefits for the family. And then when we had issues with the cladding scandal in Britain, she couldn't access the support from the Citizens Bureau, from the local MP. She was left to her own devices and just asking people for help to translate. So still, I would just stress that let's stop this romanticization, let's look at the facts and let's discuss it openly. So I'm really grateful that we can have these conversations with the very mixed group of people that you all have your own experiences and, and, and you can really bring this value to the table. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Agnieszka. Um, Okay, I'm, I'm going to be a bit of devil's advocate here because um, I, I, I think we... I, I used to campaign for open borders, um, uh, particularly, well, sorry, I'll, I'll go back. Uh, I was uh, very much involved in reducing visa restrictions and regulations that the UK government um, imposed on uh, visitors um, for temporary visits to the UK artists and academics and writers and intellectuals. Uh, and we did, um, you know, thankfully, <laughs> ironically, not under Labour, but under the Conservative government, we managed to get some kind of uh, win or concession which allowed artists to come and be paid to visit countries um, from out, sorry, 
non-European artists at the time, because we were part of the European Union still, um, to come and get paid work for temporary visits and events like this, for example, or concerts or book launches or exhibition openings. So my, my kind of interest in, in, in reducing the bureaucracy and reducing paperwork and reducing the, the endless madness that sometimes uh, um, uh, 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 um, migrant artists or visitors may encounter uh, can be almost Kafkaesque, you know, theatre of the absurd. Um, the other, there's obviously another narrative, and, you know, a lot of people say, well, what about um, other immigrants? You know, you can't just campaign for artists and intellectuals and academics. Um, what about uh, ordinary migrants? And, and, and I said, well, I didn't have a right answer on that. You know, I kind of felt, okay, that's a very important question. You know, are we allowing some people in and others not, and um, and you know, just looking at what's going on uh, in the Belarus-Polish border at the moment. And uh, only this morning, I was looking at some photographs by, uh, I believe, a Polish photographer. Uh, one of them made uh, a photograph of the year uh, for Time magazine, I think, uh, uh, at the end of 2021, which you know was a very powerful image of um, uh, of um, migrants at the border. Um, and you know some other. We have to say, look, victims do exist, yeah. and and these are you know <laughs> the people that are struggling, that are very uh, escaping from all kinds of regimes that we have talked about. You know, Afghanistan, Syria, um, uh, Iraq, um, Iran. Iran, yes, and uh, Iraq and Iran. Uh, you know, people from the Kurdish communities, um, uh, people that have. Uh, uh, you know, being uh, uh, incarcerated or attacked by the Taliban, you know. So we are, we kind of, these are some of the people. Uh, may, there may not be all the people at these borders uh, at trying to cross the, the, the channels, uh, English Channel, or trying to cross um, uh, the, 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 the border. What I think is also important to be discussed is how immigrants or migrants, in this case, are being used by um, uh, certain regimes. Um, and we can't ignore that, you know, they are, in a sense, um, pawns in, as you said, you know, kind of a state, um, uh, state authoritarian politics. Um, so that's just a thought I wanted to throw out there, because um, uh, while we refused, and I refused to be uh, seen as a, a victim, uh, and all of us refused to be seen as victims, we are all uh, uh, <laughs> examples of not, of not to, to sort of portraying that victim narrative, uh, but there are people who are suffering too, and we kind of, I just wanted to kind of put that thought out there to kind of hear people's thoughts, and obviously I'm sure you may have thoughts in the audience. Um, any more thoughts on that? We have a few more minutes to discuss across the panel, and then we'll open it out to the audience. There, there is one thing that I wanted to think, was thinking about, which is the importance of common law in, in England. Um, and common law applies to everyone, it doesn't, regardless of their immigrant status or indigenous status or whatever, that's irrelevant. And, and I think the most important thing is for anybody coming to a Western European country to accept common law, because Sharia law or any other law, um, it doesn't, this, this is what it really boils down to, the laws that we want to live under. And if we want to live in an open, free society, then we all have to uphold those laws. And postmodernism, which is the kind of prevailing philosophy, does not really respect that. Uh, it, it's, it's into collectivism, which means that the individual is irrelevant. So it's, it's creating this kind of false um, f illusion where you're constantly, through the use of mass media, reminded of your victim status. But... but you know, and that's again not to say that people that aren't suffering. I'm not saying that. Of course, they are, but it, but it's a kind of trick on the hands of authorities to to change the laws at will and to really screw with those those very ancient freedoms that are that need to be respected. That's really to me. I mean, culture is culture and changes, and it's interesting and it's fluid. But that's the discussion we should have. What kind of you know society do we want to live in? And if, if, the, if, the, if the base culture is constantly undermining itself and saying, oh, no, we're just 
you know, the, the patriarchy or we're just a bunch of racists or we're just a bunch of xenophobes. This needs to just stop because it's... <laughs> I, I, I completely agree with you because when I was campaigning for... Um, I was working with this organisation, independent Yemen group, um, Lubna, uh, amazing women, uh, using... Uh, um, adults, the girls who are actually get pulled out of school and married off in Yemen. So just to highlight, and I, I, we had kind of like, oh, um, it's like not talk about it. it it's like... Uh, um, it's, it's almost like an it's, amoral it's, act, yeah, but it's, it's, it's sanctified like, uh, by a divine law. It's picking and choosing what uh, well, no, we don't want to upset, uh, you know. And it's a shame because they're... they're uh, it is a complex, you know, when yeah. you... I mean, it, it's uh, everybody who will leave their home country, they're leaving it for a reason. Could be a war, could be um, persecution from family, could, uh, many reasons. But I think uh, when... Uh, and everybody struggles. That's life. You yeah. struggle. That, like well, welcome to the real world. <laughs> you will struggle no matter, you know, what... Uh, uh, but just part of life. But I think, and I find it is... Um, a lot of migrants when we come to UK, uh, they work hard. And, but when you achieve certain things, they meant, it's like if you achieve things and, and do things, and then you kind of change your way of thinking, they don't like that. It's like, oh, but you are, you know, well, it's suffered. Yeah. No, I, yeah, I've gone through, a, uh, you know, I've I gone through a lot, and, 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 but I, 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 I like to take the negative, turn it to positive, and, and you know, get on and, and to empower myself, to be an example to my kids. And it's like, uh, if you're going to sit there and moan all the time, and poor me, it's not, you would never achieve in life. So I think... Uh, the mindset. The mindset needs to be changed, and not just to the... Sometimes the people will really hold me back. It was in the, in the Western world, you know, it's like, uh, A, you don't look, uh, you suffered, and... Um, and to criticizing your culture. I said, no, I love my culture. and my, There's more to my culture than child marriage, forced marriage, or honor killing. There's more to it, you know. But I'm just highlighting this, that it happens to a lot of girls. I'm lucky that I have the, the courage to fight it. There's a lot of girls don't. So uh, and it, me talking about it still doesn't mean I criticize my parents. I love my parents. They change. My niece and nephew, they're all gone to university. They're all educated. I didn't have that opportunity, but it can be changed, and my family changed. Yeah, um, I think it's very important that uh, we have the this discussion with... Um, I know, uh, for example, that Canada only takes immigrants from a family, and if you are a higher class or if you are very educated, uh, you can come in, but if you are not having a education or something like that, you cannot come into Canada. And um, also um, f other uh, European countries that they have the rules. And I, I think it's a, a very good rule because you can see in Sweden, they are taking everyone and it's so problematic. There are so many problems in Sweden honor killings and uh, uh, grenades it, yeah and oh yes yeah, stuff like that and um, and also in the uh, in the UK you have also yeah. many honor killing kill, killings and uh, acid um, acid attacks yeah. yes so I think it's very important that uh, we have the discussion who are welcome and who is not because when I was in Greek, uh, I saw uh, Frontex working. I saw um, a, a man. You you all know the the, the Che Guevara, uh, the T-shirt, the printing with the Che Guevara, and he had a, a printing with the the Hezbollah. And I, I was thinking, oh my fucking god! I'm sorry. I don't want him to go to Europe because I know. His, what you have called it, mindset. mindset, yeah. And I don't want this guy. So we have to talk about who are that, we. Again, it's are we like the, the romantic yeah. idea of the immigrant yeah. is basically obscuring from view any kind of 
nuanced discussion about people who are actually have their own ideas, their own value systems that might be ant what's the antithesis of yours that might actually set to destroy your what you view of the world. So it's kind of that you know that's goes beyond viewing people as the sum of their parts and into the kind of ideas and beliefs that are expressed and, and you know, what's going to work and what isn't, basically. It's, exactly it's actually same. interesting because that brought to my mind, Miriam, just to finish uh, on what my, Miriam was saying, that it's, I find it actually racist that um, yeah, our middle and upper classes in the Western world, they think that they understand the situation and that the newcomers, especially the ones that, oh, maybe there's an ideology, Islamic terrorism, Sharia law, and so on. Once they get this um, better TV set, once they get the car um, and have a nice apartment, they will change their way. They will understand <laughs> that our ideas are better. So actually, I find it quite patronizing and, and um, racist yeah. that you don't value the fact that the other person has got a set of values and ideas and acts on them according to what they believe in. Without going into discussion whether we agree with it or not, but just like acknowledging they believe in something and they believe strongly and they act on it. I respect it. And I don't have naive view that once they have the TV and so on, they change their way. Once they have the TV. <laughs> Okay, well, I, I think I'd like to really open it out to um, you, the audience, who are as important as uh, uh, my guests. Are, are there going to be microphones for the audience? Mm -hmm. If not, we can share. Yeah, you can share. Yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, I am Marius. I am very lucky. I met these guys uh, at the hotel yesterday, and uh, they invite me for the conference, and I come. And um, uh, so uh, it's great that you have discussion, and uh, you can open uh, say what you think, because I think we may uh, we don't have this discussion in Poland now. We have uh, two blocks like the two blocks of people, one block say, okay, we uh, we don't want immigrants, and uh, another say, okay, invite all of them, and it's point of the tension between the, the people in Poland. And I, I've never been immigrant, however, I've been uh, many times for a longer time abroad, and I've been alone, and I tried to be not with Polish people, but with the um, local people. And uh, sometimes I also had problems, like from example in, in Holland, when they kicked me from the study and held me a cord and a man from Pakistan. And uh, they gave me a house uh, for free, for three months, and that really helped me a lot. Uh, 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 when I ask, uh, I don't feel, I didn't feel the migration problem in the United States and also in Canada, but I uh, felt that in uh, in, in uh, Holland, in Netherlands. I, I asked the police officer if they have uh, problems with immigrants and say, we have problems with, like, for example, some part of immigrants, like, for example, from Morocco, uh, because uh, there is totally different, uh, um, there is totally different uh, culture there, and that people are not uh, and not educated. Ma Mario, and sorry, if, if, we, we, because we have lack of time. Uh, can you get to a question? Yeah, yeah. If you have uh, a question, that would be great. So. Oh, okay. I, I just. Uh, Maybe it's not the question, but it's a um, uh, problem. I have one question. If you, you all from the different countries, but you can't find your idea or uh, how to live between, uh, with each others as immigrants with different countries, or uh, is this is possible to find a 
um, common way to live, for example, in Britain, or uh, there are some people, of course, to, uh, to don't want to leave their roots and, and f uh, seek the help in their local yeah. community, like so, Polish so, so or Yemeni. So about uh, integration rather yes. than ghettoization. Yes. Okay, um, thank you. Anyone else um, with questions? Thank you. Uh, so I have a question for you. Uh, like I completely agree, uh, agree that uh, like a number of uh, migrants are actually good people, but some of them are like not willing to accept the uh, culture, the like the laws of the country they came in. Uh, and so, like, um, what is more important? Uh, and also, there is a problem, obviously, with discrimination of the hosting nation to the migrants, because some of, some of the people like think that all oh, the migrants are bad, and we should like, uh, like abolish them. So, what is more important to like educate the migrants uh, to accept the culture of the country they came in, or to educate the people from the country, like the hosts, to accept the migrants? What is more important to solve first? I, I, Thank you. Any, an, another question? And then we can come back to the panel. We're going to do all the questions now. Okay. Should we um, answer? Yeah, answer the questions now. Yeah, okay. I actually think it might... The problem is that the host culture is very self-destructive. That's the problem. So, on the outside, it, it appears that we want everyone from all over the world because we love every culture and we love your cooking and we love your food. But on the inside, they are, ha they are having a kind of collective mental breakdown and have been doing that for a long time where they don't like their own history and they don't like their own culture and they're ashamed of themselves. So they have no... They, I mean, that's a, an ongoing process of, of, of self-degradation and they, ha they have to... <clears throat> the host culture has to learn to re-appreciate... Uh, not uh, not to romanticise again, <laughs> not to say well we you know ro to 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 go off in the other direction, but it's uh, just a kind of a balance, because if the host culture is actually more interested in self destruction, you know that, then then you're just left with a void. Every 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 other culture is just papering over the cracks, it's just papering over the cracks, and that's so sad. And so, in, and so, in, so wrong. And in, and um, and so, I believe in. The, when my great grandparents came to to England from from Warsaw, actually, <laughs> just here, this was like uh, 120 years ago. The first thing they did was went to Whitechapel Library and they they got the dictionary out and they just learned to speak English by just memorising words in the dictionary. So they were always wanting to be. You know, we're going to be British now. This is what we're going to do. But since the idea of the, the host culture has slowly, since the post-war period, slowly kind of um, gone to dust, they, there's nothing to assimilate into. So that's the problem. Yeah, I think uh, the problem is that they, they don't give any information. Um, but uh, I know um, some of the European countries are, uh, they are beginning to uh, make a, a book of uh, rules and information, and uh, I actually saw one. Uh, it was from Sweden, and there was information uh, like you can hit your child, you can um, make um, uh, what do you call it, um, um, uh, kill your daughter because uh, of blah 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 blah, and you have to learn the language, and you have to. Uh, give uh, your your uh, wife some um, um, uh, freedom to go out and uh, have an edu education. So I think maybe it's a good place to start to give uh, the migrants informations because um, lots of them are, you know, they are coming for poor places, so they don't know the rules in Europe. No, but I, I also I think it's very important to make it simple. Uh, when you go to, um, to UK, that's, I mean, the, the crazy thing is, I don't know why we have Sharia court in UK. It's crazy. 
Um, and I always think, well, what's the point leaving Yemen or what's the point leaving your country? You're running away from it because you didn't have that uh, e equality or opportunity. So I find it, make it simple. Is uh, This is our law. You got to respect it. It's like if I, when you go to Saudi Arabia or Dubai or another Islamic country, they tell you clearly, this is our law. You got to respect and follow it. And it's the same thing with Margaret. If they're going to Western world, there is going to be a certain way that maybe that's not will be their, uh, uh, go, uh, their ideas of their culture or religion, but you've gone in there for reason, and then you got to respect it, and, and, uh, and you got to learn the la language. It will benefit you and your kids and your next generation because you will have that opportunity. So I, I, I think just make it simple. Everybody's equal, and uh, you go to that land, you'll respect the land, law, and rules. Um, and if you don't like it, you got to then migrate to Islamic country or go to other country who will have that same uh, viewpoint and, and the, the law that you want. But I, I just find it is in 22, we still have Sharia court in UK. Yeah, I, I just think that's just crazy because it's only women who suffer and they got to remember is that the women and the female who I get are not uh, treated equally in that court. Thank you. Thank you, it's a very good question. Any more questions? Arthur? Sorry, we allow other people to speak, thank you. I'll be a very short one. Uh, thank you very much for having this discussion. I'm very thankful for being here, and it's very interesting, all the work that you've done. Uh, I just have a question regarding the first picture that was, uh, at the beginning you were showing different pictures with uh, this happy family and the extremists, Islamic extremists, and you were saying that it was rejected in Great Britain to be shown. And my question is, would it have been rejected if it wasn't for the migration crisis? What, 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 what were the reasons behind it being rejected? Well, obviously the police would not explain it to us, first of all, because they were trying to pretend that they actually haven't censored it. Yeah. That was the official line. Um, I think they were afraid of a terror attack. Uh, it's plain and simple, because 2015 was one of the toughest years in Europe with terror attacks, one after another. So, um, because the gallery was close to Buckingham Palace, I think they were afraid of a um, massive global scandal. And they, they were trying to create um, a, a feeling of fear for us, not to even touch these subjects, to, to just just gloss over it. So in a sense, this strategy is going on, it continues, it's, it's also now, trying to avoid the subject um, and not to deal with it. Um, what, what is interesting that, um, was it a year after Miriam, uh, there, was a, there was a TV program and um, Trevor Phillips, a, a great uh, figure in Britain that actually contributed to work on equality and, and um, anti-racism and so on, he started questioning this politics of diversity where we only celebrate diversity yeah. but we don't question the, the negative sides of this diversity and we don't try to encourage assimilation and, and taking the law of the land. So he himself, although he contributed to the situation, he started to question it publicly and he was preparing a program surveying the um, Muslim population of Britain and how well integrated they are and what are their views on homosexuality, what are their views on if you knew a member of your family or a friend is preparing a terror attack, would you report them? So he was preparing a program around that and then he was interested in the fact that we couldn't show this work. So. We were invited to, to, to show the work, but the way it was shown was that there was a container, uh, like a um, ship container hired for a few hours, and it was, the artwork was placed in that container in, in a square for a few hours, but it was all hush-hush. It was not made publicly known, and there were like just few passers-by because it was a freezing day in February, and they were being asked what do they think about this work and whether they would be afraid to see it in a gallery or not. But it was, it was surreal that even to, to question this idea, it was all done in secret in a shipping container in the middle of nowhere on a freezing uh, February day. So yes, I, I think it's out of fear. I think there's a fear of discussing these things pu publicly. There's a fear of attacks. Um, also, as I said at the beginning of our meeting, yes, and 
the other thing is with, with what we have to remember is follow the money. What money is invested in Western countries with, from which countries? The investment from Qatar, that it's sponsoring terror around the world, the, 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 the money from Iran sponsoring terror around the world. We need to also look at the money and how the particular countries, what kind of investment is done in these countries, where it's from, and then that also gives us an answer why the, our mouth is being shut. Because you cannot talk about it because the money would be withdrawn and the politicians yeah. will have to show their naked bums. I, I totally agree. Any more questions from the audience? Or thoughts? Sorry, I'm just wait for... Small one. Um, any online questions? Come on. <laughs> We're not that scary, you know. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and it, that, 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 any questions? I mean, you, you must. Is anyone, is anyone shocked and horrified? <laughs> totally offended. Are you going to cry? All right. right. <laughs> so come on, you must have a question then. You, okay. you know, Kira, this is your no. opportunity. I'm, I'm going to ask a, 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 a question then, um, and then we'll come back if, if you have more thoughts. Um, Can I have a small one? One second. Um, we could, we'll come back to you in a minute. Um, so... I think what I, what I also have noticed is how um, the narrative, um, where the dominant narrative is about that of the migrant, and you know, even in art and literature, but there's the narrative of the host um, communities or host citizens uh, are usually portrayed as xenophobic. Um, and you know, an example uh, which I wrote about of uh, a work by uh, a very well-known British artist called Jeremy Della, who won the Turner Prize. Um, during lockdown, there was um, uh, an outdoor exhibition of uh, outdoor public art um, uh, outside the South Bank Centre in London. And um, uh, the centrepiece of the exhibition was a Jeremy Della billboard, massive, about probably about the size of this um, uh, screen. Uh, maybe slightly bigger, um, which said um, uh, something like 100,000 immigrants saving racist lives. Um, and it was a comment on uh, the, the pandemic uh, and um, the number of, um, you know, there were quite a lot of um, uh, doctors and nurses uh, from minority backgrounds who died uh, uh, as a result of the pandemic of catching coronavirus. Um, and and he was making this comment, you know, this, this sort of very black and white comment that immigrants are saving these racist asses, you know. And, <laughs> um, uh, and I kind of, what I find is this sort of, um, you don't hear the stories from the host citizens or host communities who may have a concern about migration, um, um, but they are silenced and they are cancelled. Their voices are not, um, are not given any authenticity. So uh, I just wanted to kind of, why is that? Why, why in art don't we hear the other voices in an honest, authentic way? I, I, I think a lot of what's happened is, it, is a class war uh, masquerading as something about immigrants. Because when they talk about, you know, the xenophobic, racist, bigoted, Nazi, they're basically talking about the white working class, like th those poorer than them. It's it's all like a, a, a lingo, like a double like a double talk. But you wouldn't actually say that. This is the problem. It's like they have this um, incredible arrogance. They're not talking about themselves. This is they did the same thing with Brexit. It was exactly the same, a caricature and an unwillingness to listen. So if I, this is what's happened, in, and in, with everything now, it's even if you if you disagree with any of the thinking, you know they'll. They'll find a term and then put you in that box, and and that's it. But that, those are the people you. that they were caricaturing. And and the weird thing is, like, if you actually look at the reality, like, the highest rate of intermarriage in the UK is in the white working class communities. So all of that, like those, those communities in housing estates, where you have people from Somalia and Jamaica and and you know all over the world, they're all you know they get on quite well. It's it's this um, media class in the cities who are portraying a kind of upside down universe that, that that you know, and that's why they always rely on these kind of past images of discrimination from about fifty years ago or sixty years ago. It's like, oh look, things are still like that now. It's, no, they're not. <laughs> it's an unwillingness to admit that there's there's been a change. You know. Yeah. I think so. 
questions? Any more? Oh, thank you. Yes. And then we'll... Uh, yeah, also uh, one more question. So like nowadays a lot of uh, Western financial giants, uh, like they enforce uh, this, uh, like uh, the acceptance for the, gra for the uh, other culture, uh, cultures, for the migrants, like for example, the Nike brand, uh, their like uh, advertisement campaigns with uh, women wearing hijabis, but at the same time, they're actually using the child labor in the developing countries and like, <laughs> Uh, no one's paying enough attention for it. I think like everyone's yeah. support, like who, like all these big companies, they they are like uh, open-minded, but actually they're not. Like yeah. what, what's the hell? It's just, it's <laughs> okay. you are, you're absolutely right. It, it, it's just it's, it's like the 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 Nike, and then you see this mo model they're wearing a hijabi, and they encourage that. And I think there's a lot of countries like in Yemen, nobody. Uh, um, around dictatorship and Sharia uh, um, communists, there were no one covered, no one was having, till the Sharia law and, uh, came along, that's why we left the north and invaded the south, and uh, sadly still there's this war, you know, Yemen unfortunately spit a mess, but I hope and I'm, and then dream that people will, you know, come through it. Um, and like nobody talked about the bombing, uh, the Saudis and the, and the Emiratis, you know, bombed Yemen and thing. Nobody talks about it. Nobody was, you know, outside demanding the things. You know, it's like picking and choosing which, which is the fashion. It's, it's becoming a fashionable to fight for certain certain causes. And it, it, it's, it's bonkers. Like uh, child marriage, forced marriage, FGM. Ooh, but you know, for the hijab, something so simple. You know, it's like you know, I'm behind it. It's like uh, how do you say it in English? Virgin Trying to be, fir yeah, virtue. How do you say? Virg whatever is the word. <laughs> Virtually Virgin signal. Yeah. And like yeah, a superficial. But yeah, it's support, a very kind of thing. Very um, little behind it. Yeah, or there's no intellectual rigor behind it. It's just. But yeah. I always think it is that the the, the 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 middle class and educated academic people and the wealthy who have no clue what real life is because when you have the migrant coming, it's they not suffer. It's the people who um um the the, the working class. Because they can't get their doctor appointment or that housing list. Because the the migrant they get their um, um, the first priority. And I think you're right, like you said, the devisation, the politician to blame, to, to the, because they make the policy that that. So I think that you need to more look at and put the pressure on a politician on a government um, than divide of, 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 of the people, you know, because it's, it's, that's easy, so we are too busy fighting among ourselves and not knowing what exactly the cause and the problem is the, uh, the, 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 the politician who is, uh, need to, um, we actually, it's like in Yemen, if the politician are good, they, they do something different and in here there's not. Okay. Well, uh if there's one more last question, we'll hear it. So, but if not, we're going to do a final um, uh, summing up. Uh, there's one person right at the back. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Irina, and I wanted to uh, get back to the topic of uh, forced marriages uh, because uh, I totally can understand why, uh, for example, if, if uh, a person live, lives in uh, their own country, and uh, it's normal in the society to, uh, f okay, force uh, little girls and like not adults to uh, get married. And they just live it this way because they don't probably see the other possibility of living. And how can it, um, how, how does it work that someone who, uh, um, who lives in a different country where the culture is totally different and where law is different can still uh, force uh, her, his child, to, uh, to get married um, without uh, consent? Um, it's a good question. And, and it's, it's when you are, um, like when I, I came to UK, uh, I didn't have the friends, I, didn't, I was not allowed. It's a, it's, it's a restriction, even to people who are born in this country. Um, it's the culture, it's tradition, and it's the family pressure, and particular girls have to honor their the, the family name. 
So it's the more, and, and child um, and forced marriage is not just on girls, but boys. Um, it, it's very hard because you get cut off, not just through your family, but your extended family. And it's hard. Uh, it was very difficult. I, I didn't speak the English. I didn't know anybody. Um, it was very scary. Um, it was not safe to be at 17 in the street. And, but there was amazing uh, uh, organization who came help me. But I remember this one hostel, actually. It's funny, I, I discover, uh, Manik just said, that we have a, um, a, common, a, a common friend who actually, the lady, when I, when I ran away and I was in, uh, finally got the hostel, it was for runaway girls, especially, you know. Uh, the lady, my worker, so it was just like a small world, but it's very difficult. But I, uh, for it's not easy. You gotta have to have that courage to speak out. But there's now actually more help. You got many organizations can help you. When in, in this in the eighties, it wasn't. You know, I um, I think it was eighty seven. Um, it was it was no. It, I remember one organization told me, it's your culture. You know, so there, 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 there is, but I think slowly things are changing, and I think you know, um, I'm hoping anyway that I got a hope and for change, and I think it will encourage the next generation to. Um, a big example: my family, all my niece and nephew now edu educated in university, they're going leaving home to go to university, so it can be changed, um, but it's part of the traditional culture. Not all of them. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> We're running out of time. So I just wanted to add and finish off on Taslim, just mentioning that, as you said, there is more and more organizations, but we cannot be asleep. And that's why we need to have more conversations like that across the borders, across the countries, because you have to be aware that this conversation wouldn't happen in England now. It wouldn't be allowed to happen like this publicly and uh, allowing people to come and ask questions. And um, what I wanted to stress that even if there is a law that forbids something, and uh, Tazli mentioned briefly FGM, and just for the Polish uh, audience, it's female genital mutilation. This is a shorthand for that. There is a law in Britain uh, since, if I remember well, 80s, uh, that it's forbidden and there is a, it's punishable by, um, by uh, uh, prison term. But it was not enacted yet because it's not really put in action because of, of fear of being caused a ra called a racist, because of being afraid of causing some tensions in the community. And actually I was at the meeting in the parliament a few years back where there was a prosecutor from France, because in France they have successful prosecutions and the number of mutilated girls went down. And what people have to understand, the female genital, mu gen genital mutilation is not just something that is like a cosmetic su surgery down there, so you look pretty. Actually, it can cause infertility, it can cause lifelong health problems, and actually even death. So we have to remember that. And um, don't listen to the politicians when they say they cannot find a solution for that. This is the unwillingness to discuss difficult issues and to risk being called racist or anything like that. So we need to have more conversations like that, and I will give the floor to Manik to finish. And I urge you to join our conversations in future for other topics. Thank you. Okay, so... I, I'm so delighted that we've had uh, four amazing individuals, uh, artists, women, and um, I think uh, I'm very honoured to have this uh, uh, esteemed panel here. Uh, if you haven't seen the exhibition Political Arts, please do go and see it. Tomorrow is the last day. Uh, it's it's uh, incredible, and you'll get a chance to see uh, all four artists' works uh, at that exhibition. Um, and um, please, I would urge you, if you're interested in coming to further debates and discussions like this, do sign up to the Yudovsky um, newsletter, the website. Uh, come and see future exhibitions here if, you've, if, if this is your first visit. But come in two months' time. Um, I can't remember the date on the top of my head, but we have a confirmed date. Uh, the 19th of March. Uh, is the next debate. Uh, we have two confirmed speakers so far. One is an artist called Byzantia Harlow. She's an artist and a mystic. Uh, the second uh, is uh, Jojo Charlesworth, who's an uh, um, uh, editor of a 
fantastic uh, monthly um, art magazine called Arts Review, and uh, he's um, he's a Marxist and a humanist, so it should be quite interesting. Uh, and we're waiting for uh, uh, two more speakers to confirm, but uh, please put that date in your diary for the next uh, uh, discussion, which will be on the sacred and the profane, um, religion, mysticism, and um, neo-paganism, digital spiritualism, <laughs> you name it. Uh, it's going to be uh, a, a, a very good debate. Um, I would like to thank everyone, uh, the, the technical team, uh, at the Uyodoski, uh, thank you for a brilliant job because uh, it's not easy putting uh, uh, this work together when uh, artists, uh, uh, you know, are artists. <laughs> and uh, and uh, haven't forgot, I have not forgotten the translators. Thank you to our wonderful uh, Polish English translators here. Uh, uh, and uh, they've done a great job too because uh, this has been on, uh, on Facebook Live in Polish, uh, dubbed in Polish and um, uh, in, in uh, English on uh, YouTube. So thank you to our virtual audience out there. Uh, I wish we could see you all, but uh, I'm sure we'll be getting lots of comments on, on various uh, platforms. Um, Berta, uh, the Deputy Director, thank you, as well as um, Marcel, uh, the uh, fellow Deputy Director, and Piotr, um, uh, the Chief Executive um, and um, uh, uh, Overall Director. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I, uh, I think, you know, uh, Warsaw is doing something, and this museum particularly, that many other capitals and major um, public museums are not doing. So. We need to get this, uh, these debates, uh, the cultural tensions debates on the map, and also uh, some of the, the exhibitions, which the political art exhibition is one example of what I think will be some really interesting uh, exhibitions uh, 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 happening at this uh, fantastic venue. And I'd like to thank you all for coming uh, in, a, uh, in these very difficult times uh, during the pandemic. Thank you. Right. Drink. <laughs> <laughs>